This police officer is frozen in fear inside the Mandalay Bay Hotel as the Las Vegas massacre unfolds. Get down, get down. The gunman is firing from inside his hotel suite on the 32nd floor, but Officer Cordell Hendricks on the floor below makes no effort to bring the bad guy down. Oh my God. Now he's being branded a coward and fired. It's the front entrance. Who the fuck's coming in the employee entrance in the back? Like you all are fucking pussies. You are choosing areas where they're not at. Who? I think Henderson swatted what she said. Do they not have fucking lights in their car? It would be a really fucking bad day if second ISIS party ran out of here. You're not going to be able to stop this shit. Special events lieutenant needs to stay the fuck off the radio. You have no business here, sir. God damn it. Control 30 is 55. We have two or three armored cars that are at uh, Russell, Las Vegas Boulevard. They're not affiliated with law enforcement, but the sergeant called them from Battlefield, Las Vegas, and they're waiting to fuck for, for their orders. Oh, sure. They're going to be going to South Central Earth. You used to? Control 105. I'm going to go ahead and establish Mandalay Command if the CP has no problem with that. Jumping over that wall. Huh? Jumping over that wall. Fuck that. Yeah, yeah, I ran on somebody's head. I mean, I mean it's. have not been here we we have felt the need to to share and because las vegas has gotten so much love and um they Support. really deserve some praise for that night and um, that night of october 1st affected our family greatly Personally, yep uh, yes both of our husbands were on duty that night a normal work day yep <laughs> normal sunday so it wasn't <laughs> working um and both of our husbands had trainees with them um, that night. And um, my husband's trainee had been about three weeks into the program already, so a little bit of experience there. Yeah. And has been a former. Yeah, he was a corrections officer before, so he at least was experienced mm -hmm. somewhat with it. My husband's trainee, um, it was her second day out of the academy. Technically, we would call it her first day because the very first day, it was a lot of paperwork and um, just things at the station that they were learning. Mm -hmm. And so it was her very first night um, out on the streets of Las Vegas. And um, we have debated on how much we share of what they did that night, where they were, and um, not because we aren't proud of them, because um, 
we've now decided to share their story with their blessing yeah. um, and to share where they were. But even as of yesterday, we weren't going to, um, right. just because they have struggled with um, the idea of their heroism. I can't even say it. <laughs> their heroism that night. So yeah, so if you see us get emotional, we're gonna try, we're gonna share what they did, and then we are gonna go kind of right back into our normal podcast because getting back to normal for us has been a struggle and we are plowing forward and moving forward. Trying to find so, our new normal here. So, yes. Yeah, you'll see smiles, but I'm literally shaking. So yes. we might we might start to shake. So I I'm think so you sorry. should because you you started that night out for me. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Do you want me to start? I know um, you're nervous. No, I, I I probably should get it over with because I'm already worked up because it brings us right back to it. I mean, we were home. We weren't there experiencing it, but we were experiencing it through them, um, which is terrifying in itself. It's a whole different experience. Um, But, you know, our husbands, like, you know, have been police officers for a couple years now, several years now. Yeah, we're at five. uh, Five out six since he started um, with the academy. Uh, So, um, you know, they... We've always thought of them as brave for their jobs. We've always been proud of them. They have some pretty crazy stories yeah. working the strip as it is. Um, they've even been on that uh, Vegas strip yeah. talk show that yeah. was on TV for a little bit. Um, so we have we've had a lot of police wife experience yeah. at this point. We thought. <laughs> um, so one thing about being a police wife is you have to come to terms with the fact that your husband will always go to protect people no matter what's going on. Um, that my husband flat out told me many, many years ago, I will run towards what's the danger. He's like, I'm not going to turn away. Um, you know, he's, we've had that talk of even when we're out together Mm -hmm. off duty, he has said, if I tell you to run, you run and don't look back because I'm going the other way. Um, which is emotional enough, even just saying that, but it's something that as a police wife, you're just kind of proud of your husband for, you know, um, we just hope they never had the chance to prove it. We always knew right. that they would do that. We just hope they never had the chance to prove it, but they did that night. Exactly. So um, my husband was uh, driving what they call the paddy wagon, the prisoner transport van that night, which all they're supposed to do is pick up um, people from different locations along the strip that are being arrested for different things and transport them to the jail. And they all take turns doing that throughout yeah. the month. And- Absolutely. They sign up, and um, it's kind of like an easy night. <laughs> yeah, they get to they, they get to go to, take turns. They get to go to dinner early type thing. It's like, and, he, and my husband wasn't feeling well that day, yeah. that morning. He felt like he was getting a cold. And I even said to him, I was like, are you sure you even well enough to go? And he's like, Psh, I can go. It's no big deal. And, um, so yeah, I mean, they were driving the paddy wagon to have an easy night. Um, so they were a couple streets away when the first call came out of, um, and let's preface this with, it was kind of chaos when the first call came out because they didn't really know what was going on. Um, so when and the they, first call came from inside the venue, right inside, inside the concert, inside the Route 91 concert, because that's where people were hit. Yeah. Um, and that, so that is where I know there's some of what we get into. There might be a lot of media things that don't necessarily show all of that, but and which is why we struggled with how much we say. But um, with our husband's blessing and because we have this platform, we're able to put out there what happened to them and what the truth is. Their truth. Yeah. All we know is their truth of what they had in the time frame that they experienced Um, them. So what they heard over the radio came from the Route 91 and they believed that there was a shooter inside the concert. Those were the first radio transmissions that came. So my husband and his trainee load right up in the van and take off to the concert. (coughs) Um, show up immediately. I mean, it was within a second of the first call coming out. They showed up and um, where they came up along the boulevard um, was right at the intersection, right in front of Mandalay Bay. And so they come speeding around and whip around the corner and park right at the concert because that's where they believed it was. Um, by the time they to leave or, yeah, or go escape out of the boulevard. Um, so uh, he did say that by the time they actually parked, they started getting called, uh, saying that's coming from across the street. So they thought it could be like maybe the shooter had already ran and was like standing on the corner there. So that's why they parked right there too to be um, in between, uh, essentially just running to wherever they could yeah, to stop the guy. Um, so immediately when he stepped out of the van and he was in the passenger side, so when he stepped out 
we now know he was in direct line. Um, so they step out of the van and they walk towards the front of it, trying to figure out what's going on, and they immediately get they receive gunfire. I can probably say part of her story better than she can because it's it's emotional for her and probably vice versa. Um, <laughs> I tell Corey's, but they they the gunman uh, diverted his firing from the crowd onto the officers that showed up in their in their van as he was and in the cars. There was like um, I believe three patrol cars in the van. Yes, it was his paddy wagon, the van, and uh, I believe it was two or three. I can't remember right now. Um, right there, so they immediately get out, take cover behind the van, uh, which was just getting pelted, uh, just completely targeted. And After it was all said and done, uh, her husband David was there as investigators were counting bullets in his van, and, and uh, just in the van was he they were at stopped 60. kind of watching them count at 60. Yeah, they were still, um, and that was at his van alone, so directly where he was standing and the ground around that immediately area was just at 60 and that's when he left <laughs> they were still counting them um, so they took fire behind the van uh, which was not good enough cover because of the way it was positioned so um, they immediately run and take cover behind the other patrol car um, continue to be pelted um, they uh, that car just gets lit up as they as their term would be um, and so they run to the other patrol car and try to get behind the engine block because that's the best cover for them. Um, while he is taking cover right there, uh, sure, I'm her sure you've heard this part on the news, um, another trainee, not his trainee, but one that he's taking cover with, uh, Brady Cook, was shot in the shoulder and the, well, they believe it like ricocheted, so he has a couple. Kind of moved around in his um, body and that's punctured. You'll hear the sheriff say that he has four kind of wounds uh, there. Yeah, in and out yeah. spots. Um, so uh, yeah, he's standing right there as he um, gets shot and Brady's uh, field training yeah. officer, Officer Haynes, um, immediately takes him and David said that they just took off. He said, oh, I'm gonna get you out of here and they just took off. He's like, I didn't even know where he went. They just ran to he get drove him to the, the UMC. Because as they've said in their, in their interviews that they have done and most of these officers that, that we talk about and that you hear on the news, we have extensive history we know all of them yeah. very well <laughs> um the family i mean that's yeah. the beautiful thing about our metro yeah. police department is it really is a family and especially when you are at convention center which these officers are stationed at convention center that is the first when they talk about the first responders they are the first first because that is their area of command and so there were a lot of responders who responded um, you know, to that scene as the shooting's going on, but we know now the shooting really only lasted a, a, a certain period of time, and it's the, it's convention center officers who are regular patrol officers and officers who were off duty in that venue. They are the ones who, and ones who are on duty in that venue mm -hmm. at overtime. They are the ones who are there during the active shooting. Yeah. Um, so Brady and or Cook and Haynes take off, they're still getting pelted. There is, uh, he said there was a little bit of a lull and that's when a, um, there was a wall kind of behind them that was part of the concert venue that people were already hiding behind. Rock wall, yeah. So uh, they took off in twos to go run and literally leap over this wall to go hide behind it. Um, and I've seen pictures and videos of other random people on Facebook that have posted that have no idea that they're posting <laughs> videos of these things of my husband there. Um, and you can see there's um, uh, shots following them as they're running to jump behind the wall and then they still were taking the fire cover um, behind the wall. And that's when my husband decides to text me that he's okay. <laughs> and that's what started our night with it all. I got a text from my husband that just said, active shooter, <laughs> I'm okay. Because he always has promised me that if anything has ever happened, he would text me or something. He's he's always <laughs> got any end up wherewithal to follow through with that. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, he's, he's always said that. And it's always been like kind of in a joking manner of like, you know, even if it's my last breath, I'm gonna be texting you saying that I'm okay. Um, which sounds probably awful to some, but when you live this you life, gotta, yeah, you, you have to take humor in like some that. of those things. That's just how it is. It's, it's a fact of your life. And um, you text me. So, well, yeah, he said, active shooter, I'm okay. And I immediately said, I love you. Do you know where Corey is? Um, Corey, my husband. Her husband. And he, all he wrote back is no clue. 
Um, so I immediately texted. They always know where each other are. Yeah. So I immediately <laughs> texted to. Jen and said, uh, hey, you up? <laughs> and she said, yep. And I said, do you know where Corey is? You might want to find out. And um, I, I did, by that point, it was on um, Facebook on some of the news sites. So I just took a screenshot and I sent it to her immediately. Um, but even that, it, the news article said that there was a sniper taking yeah. out people. We still had no idea what is going on with all this. Um, so yeah, my husband continued to take fire behind the wall with several of our other officers. There's been lots of clips over the news of like these officers taking fire behind a wall and that is my husband there for them. He's not in any of the clips, but he's there mm -hmm. for all of that. Um, and not only that, but after things had calmed down, and they still have no idea what's going on though, um, but there were not any active shots coming at that yeah. point, he still joined a strike team and they stormed into Mandalay Bay to find out what was going <laughs> on, I guess, you know, if, if there was another shooter or anything, because they just have no idea. Um, and like I said, you know, it was kind of chaos with all the calls coming in, and one of the things that's been kind of frustrating on the news to hear these people talk about there being multiple shooters. Um, well, it's because people ran that were injured and they're showing up in casinos everywhere. And, and there were a lot of calls from the various casinos about multiple shooters, but um, you know, and, and whatever comes out of the truth of all of that, I, um, we know that those officers, first of all, while they were there, believe that there may have been multiple shooters and right. they searched and searched and searched for any evidence of that. Um, because they also, you know, were taking a lot of fire. And mm -hmm. so when you're taking that much fire, it's hard to believe that it could be coming from one person mm -hmm. or from one area. And um, so they did, they did search, they did do their due diligence in searching because uh, that's what they believed oh, yeah. as well. So they and searched. And my husband afterwards, um, you know, was just making comments of like, I wish I had my rifle with me. And, you know, <laughs> it's that cop in them of, I want to get the bad guys. So we, so they, they tried. Yes, they absolutely did. So while this is happening to my husband, uh, simultaneously, the exact same moment, your husband is, um, my husband has a story of his own. Yes. <laughs> my husband uh, had his trainee, his day two trainee with him. And some of the normal things that they get called out to is the various casinos um, for what they call an in-custody. And that would be anyone who's doing something inside the casinos that shouldn't be doing that. And so they go and, and the, well, the security does security, what they need to do. Yeah, and, and then they, they call um, Metro to come out and deal with those things. So my husband and his trainee right after lunch had got um, a call to respond to the Mandalay Bay. And this would be at about 9.15. Um, so well before, um, because they had two people uh, there that needed to be dealt with. Um, so they responded. And Completely unrelated mm -hmm. to all of this. Yep, just normal. I mean, really normal everyday business down there. And so they responded, and they had decided these two people um, were going to get tickets. Um, so he was showing his trainee how they process these tickets. And he was writing one, and she was writing another. Her probably first real one, yeah. not like a copy down in the academy. I hope she's had to gotten a chance to actually have some real like, <laughs> things like that because she did not get through writing those tickets. Um, while they were sitting in the security office, um, they, my husband, at about 10:05, uh, heard over the radio of a shooter inside the Route 91 concert. And all of their radio traffic is actually wildly available mm -hmm. on YouTube and um, Broadcastify. They put it all mm -hmm. out there so that you can hear their radio traffic and you can hear what they experienced. Um, so the initial things they thought, because that's where people are injured, injured is inside the concert. That's, that's where a shooter that logically, every other time we've had a massive shooting, that it's been a shooter inside or near there. So he and his trainee, they, he immediately says to the security office, there's a shooter across the street at the Route 91 concert. He gets up, his trainee turns on her body cam because they do wear body cam. Mm -hmm. And the body camera is recording all the time, but you have to manually hit a button that, that then starts, it'll go back 30 seconds and it will then save and record those mm -hmm. things. 
So she hits her, her button and um, he uh, proceeds to leave the security office and following him is his trainee and three security managers of the Mandalay Bay who happen to be in the security room with him. Um, they were not wearing body armor, they were in suits and they were armed with pistols. And so they are moving across the casino floor. Running to the Yeah, concert. actually at this point, they're, he says they're kind of moving. They're not running, they're not full on running. They are moving that direction. Um, but to not cause a panic, I guess they're not running, sprinting at that moment. Um, because on the casino floor, it was business as usual. When, you, yeah. when something like that happens 32 floors up, you can't hear it on that yeah, floor. Yeah, yeah. So it was full business as usual there. So um, they are moving across the floor. And during that time, that's when the uh, radio then says, um, no, we believe it's coming from about halfway up inside the Mandalay Bay. And my husband turns to those with him, the four with him, and says, um, they think it's coming from here. And uh, they still kind of start to move where they were going. Um, and it's literally just, just seconds before uh, Mandalay Bay, one of them on their radio said, um, we're getting conflicting reports. We think it's, it's coming from the 31st floor. So my husband looks at the security officer and says, take me there. And so they then run across the casino floor to, they took him to the elevator that faces, um, that goes up kind of in the middle and then it branches out into the different rooms. If you've seen the Manly Bay and yeah, it has like layout. long hallways. So there's a center elevator and they go there. Um, inside there, my husband had no recollection until watching body camera, that there was a maintenance worker in the elevator who um, then turns uh, they said we're going we need to go to the 31st floor and he uses his key to get them directly to the 31st floor so they get directly to the 31st floor and my husband will tell you that he um, was praying in the elevator at that point um, you know because he can hear his radio and the things that are happening but they have not heard anything inside the Manila Bay like I said but he's hearing the radio traffic of what's happening and he said I know my office has been there. pinned down um, by gunfire I can hear the gunfire over the radio and um, they step out of the elevator. And um, when they step out of the elevator, the floor is completely quiet. Um, there's no one really running around in panic or anything. Um, they get out on the, on the 31st floor, because that's the floor they were told. And they start to move down the hallway. When you hear the um, sheriff say at 10, 12, um, mm -hmm. the first two officers arrive on the 31st floor. That would be my husband and his trainee. Um, there were three security guards with him though that I do want to make sure are known because they deserve a lot of credit and um, a lot of props really mm -hmm. for going up there and following him the way that they did. And so they are moving their way and they get down towards the end of the hallway where um, there is a stairwell. And just before they reached the stairwell, my husband said the volley, the last volley of shots came out. So before this they had not heard shots and um, he then the shooter is opening fire, which we now kind of know is probably about this time because David experienced the last volley of shot right. as so, he's behind that wall. That's the last one's aimed. Yes, at my man. Yes, which the I forgot to mention the investigators um, believe you know nothing is concrete at this point. They're still investigating everything, but they believe that them showing up and going through the intersection the way they did. Um, through the attention away of, uh, I mean, you mentioned that briefly, of yeah. through the attention away from the shooter and so the target was not being targeted so anymore. People could finally run, run and escape. And so um, he is up there on the 31st floor and this, this volley of shots and he said it was unbelievably loud. Um, he said it was, it was reverberating off of the walls and it was very, very loud. And at that moment, you know, they don't know how many shooters there are or where they are. No um, idea. And so he yells at those with him to take cover. And so they they get behind, they, they back up from the stairwell and they get behind doorways and um, little inlets into the doors and take cover. And um, so then um, my husband gets over the radio and um, I've heard him on the radio. I can't even tell you how many times that I have heard the news outlets play his voice over the radio that says, um, three Mary 14, I'm in the Mandalay Bay, I'm on the 31st floor, 
and the shots are coming from one floor ahead of us, one floor above. And uh, he's bothered that he says one floor ahead. <laughs> In his critiquing Poor of God. himself, he's bothered that he says one floor ahead. They both have so many little nuances that, why yeah. didn't I do this? Why didn't I do that? And we're just sitting there like, um, <laughs> you survived. Yes. Let's, let's focus on that. And my husband has, has um, analyzed hard those moments that the gunfire is going because he, he literally had no other officers with him. Yeah, he had security officers and he had his trainee. And so as far as, you know, when they talk about they had officers together, banded together, went up, he really, he, he really didn't. He had to lead um, these people through, through the casino and into this um, terrifying who scenario. Who knows what, had to lead them into who knows what. Yeah, and he said during that. those, while the shots are going out above him, that it, it was just going through his head. I, I have these lives with me. I can't rush that room because I have these lives. And they didn't know at this moment where the room was right. either. Um, so when the shots stopped ringing out and they were able to kind of move and they moved forward um, into the stairwell and um, they entered the stairwell and my husband said, I, I thought of trying to bust down that door and go through the door. They are now in the stairwell that adjoins the doorway or the, the room of the shooter. And so, um, He's, he has, you know, critiqued himself a lot of, should I have rushed that room? But at that moment, there were no more shots being no. fired. Um, nothing, they did not hear shots at all once they were in that stairwell. And well, they still don't know where it's coming from, where it was or how many, from, because at this point, nothing was even going on. Yeah. So they're still trying to figure it all out. <laughs> yes. So, um, yeah, he has just analyzed and it's like you had, you had three people with no body armor on that probably would have followed you wherever you went. And then a trainee, it's her, it's her second day. Uh, you can't expect her to rush a room with an automatic gunfire following behind you. That you have no idea how many people are in or what's going on. As you rush with pistols into automatic gunfire. Because some of the officers, like you said, had time to get their rifle yeah. and things out of their car. They had what was on them and that's it. So they entered that stairwell and they, um, my husband said, all I could think to do was to make sure that no one escaped, that there was not a shooter who escaped down that stairwell. Um, because he said, I can't take them into active gunfire of, from, you know, a automatic weapon. Mm -hmm. So um, he also heard on his radio of, of people, other officers responding and coming. So, you know, he's thinking, I got officers coming so that we can deal with this and I don't have to put their lives in danger. Mm -hmm. um, so they stayed in that stairwell, the five of them, this little oh, five, five group of them holding that stairwell until um, Sergeant Bisco, who is a canine sergeant that my husband knows very well because mm -hmm. he um, does the canine trials and things that you were just at yesterday. And um, so he knows them very well. And my husband said um, that he, Sergeant Bisco yelled out as he was coming up the stairs to meet them, um, Metro, Metro, Metro. And my husband back answered back, Metro, Metro, Metro. And um, he said it was like the sweetest three words he had ever heard because, you know, as he said, the cavalry was here and, and my backup was coming. So um, Sergeant Bisco has been on uh, 60 Minutes and mm -hmm. did um, his interviews and things there and talked about how they breached the room. But my husband and his his four ragtag, there was really only about a total of eight officers who breached that room mm -hmm. and um, busted into that room. Um, it wasn't a lot of SWAT. You know, you heard SWAT busting in that room. There, I believe there was one SWAT officer and then it was their group of who they had that was there that busted into that room and you know where they talk about why they wait so long and things well um there were barricades up and locked and um cameras and all of these things that they had no idea what they were walking into mm -hmm. if it was booby trapped um those sorts of things so so my husband was right there as they breached that room and um, he really didn't go in the room because 
pretty quickly they they discovered that he uh, was no longer living, the shooter, and so then it's a crime scene. Mm-hmm. And so as he said, you know, his, he really didn't even breach the room before they discovered that he is uh, no longer with us. So my husband was like, it's a crime scene. I'm not contaminating mm-hmm. that crime scene. So, you know, he backed out and let, let those who um, handle all that handle all that. And then our husbands were there. Yours was oh. clearing floors. And mine was downstairs, like guarding, keep, keeping people out. They were there. Their normal shift starts at 3 p.m. Yeah. at night. And they didn't come home till about 8.30. And they had carpools. Yeah, <laughs> of course. Which I had, like, made a point. I kind of just made a face with him. I didn't even say anything, but he said that uh, they were going to carpool that day, and I knew my husband wasn't feeling well. And so when he said that Corey was on his way, <laughs> I was I like, kind of made a face of like, really? Because now you can't leave early if you get worse while you're at work, you know? I don't want him sick at work with anything going on yeah. as it is. And But they had to uh, wait for each other to get done to come home, but we were up all night. Yeah. Uh, I had listened to the scanner all night long, along with my daughter, Macy who's 19, mm-hmm. um, fielded all your information coming yes, to me from the scanner. Because it's hard to listen to that scanner. You, yeah. you you either have to decide that you are going to listen to it or right. you're not. Because I had texted Corey when she texted me and said that David didn't know where Corey was. I texted Corey. I wanted to call him. I really wanted to call him. <laughs> sure. Because <laughs> he always answers your call. He does. Always. My husband always. Will, always. My husband's more of like, I'm at work, I'm focused. My husband... And we'll answer his phone when I go, why are you answering your phone? <laughs> Don't answer your phone. It's okay. But, and so I wanted to call him, but I, I knew in that moment I can't call him. Um, so I text him, and I, I literally just pleaded, please, 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 please say something. And um, I didn't hear anything. So I turned on the scanner. Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, and I also, because someone reminded me, hey, find my iPhone. Mm-hmm. And I can see where he is. He was in the Mandalay Bay. But that's so all it shows. Right. I know. It shows that they're in the Mandalay Bay, and you're just like, but <laughs> where? <laughs> and what is going on? Yes. Because, you know, still they're getting calls from everywhere, and they have no idea. Yeah. You know, it, it's just. So, <laughs> yeah. So we, I stuck by the scanner on my own. I, I just needed to hear his voice, and I did hear his voice. I did not hear him say on the radio, I tuned in too late to hear him say he's on the 31st floor, but I hear him later. Um, on the on the scanner, he actually whispers because they are outside of they're sharing a room in that stairwell yeah. or a door, a wall. If I can speak right, they're sharing a wall with the room that the shooter is in, and so he whispers from the stairwell, um, Three Mary Fourteen. I'm in the stairwell on the thirty second floor, and when I when I heard him whisper, I lost it. <laughs> I just cried. And I had initially turned on the scanner the same time you did. We did it almost simultaneously, yeah. and I could hear some of the things going on, and they were, I just couldn't, it was rough. Um, it was hard to hear.